Welcome to Soul Forum. We're delighted to have you here for this series we're calling Soul Body. Each conversation in this second season takes us deeper into the experience of our own bodies, the collective body, the earth body, and even the cosmic body, as we explore the way soul finds expression in our time. We hope what you discover along the way helps you journey a little deeper into your own soul body. In our last three episodes, Brian, as an artist, helped push beyond the idea of an individual soul in order to explore what might be a collective soul. In this episode, Dan sits down with Karen as she shares her deepest connections to the earth as a way to imagine a sense of soul born within this primary relationship. We hope you find that her insights awaken your deep relationship with earth, including the earth body you inhabit. Here is Dan getting ready for Earth Day and his conversation with Karen. So I was all excited to talk to Karen, um, partly because Karen, you know, we were close to Earth Day and uh, there's a lot of Earth Day energy floating around. So I was super excited that Karen would be all geared up for Earth Day. Come to find out Earth Day is one of her least favorite days of the year. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh, I don't know where this conversation is going to go because it has been one of my favorite days of the year, right? It's a day for me to focus in on my relationship with the earth. But for her, she points out, and I think rightly so, right, that we're human, humans have kind of objectified their relationship with the planet and the biosphere to the point where we then pick a day where we celebrate that relationship. And we do that all the time with our relationship with nature, right? We think, I'm going to go out and take a walk in nature as if we get to go into nature for a bit and then go back where? I mean, where are we going, right? This whole idea that we've sort of bifurcated this notion that we actually exist. We are nature. And, and that we have somehow driven a wedge between our conceptual framework of where nature is and we are is pure illusion. And she's going to unpack that illusion, I think, a little bit in her language. So that idea, and you hear it all the time, right? Even the beautiful ideas of forest bathing, right? To go out in the forest and be there and just be bathed by the forest. We're, we're, <laughs> we're still seeing it as this outside experience when in reality it's this there must be a way to kind of decenter the uh, the human at the center of this whole thing and then all of this secondary material on the outside that we get to engage with when in fact we're just a part of that whole picture Karen begins the conversation with a reflection on the importance of how we are shaped by the language we bring to our relationship with the natural world. Can a shift in language begin to reset this vital relationship? Again, the language is is so critical because one of the things that, you know, kind of makes the hair, like makes me go, "Ah," is when I hear the word nature yeah like oh we're gonna go visit nature let's go out into nature like it's disneyland or something Mm. and it's not something that's possible you can't go into something that you already are (laughs) you that's that's great we our nature there's no yeah. way to separate it out and so phrasing things like that mm-hmm. just reinforces this separateness yeah yeah so i preferred the term wild uh, okay what so what what works better about wild that helps wild, you, you know navigate this? if you're gonna go visit something <laughs> go visit the wild world or mm-hmm. you know not nature i mean it um you could you're still a wild creature um but it's more like i'm gonna connect with this wild world um 
as a distinction between the domesticated world and the wild world. Yeah, to, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. And then, and then, but still be like, oh, but I actually can't do that either because, you know, I am wild. Right. There is that wild part of me that has always been there. Mm. Um, but I think it would be, it's a better way. Like Earth Day is coming up, right? And I'm yeah, just right. like, Ugh. it's like my least favorite day of the entire calendar. <laughs> because, because it's just so ridiculous to, I mean, Oh, every day is Earth Day for Pete's sake. Like it's yeah. just such a bizarre concept. There's this one day that we go, oh, okay, we're part of this planet. Woohoo. Let's like learn how to recycle better. Just, yeah. Oh no. No, it just it's it's it just reinforces that separateness. In in many ways, it reminds me of that first um leave taking in the hebrew scriptures where we depart from the garden of eden right we we think that we left the garden of eden and we're going it on our own and we see that as a departure but in reality our soul and our body can't leave the garden <laughs> we can't you can't get out of the garden so this whole notion that we've somehow left that and then constructed civilizations and empires and engineering and constructs that then create who we are is flawed, right? Because at the core, we're, we live inside of this garden. We're in it. We're woven into it. And inside of that matrix is, this is the way I think uh, Karen would describe it, inside of that matrix, we know at a different kind of level. So as we grow or live into the awareness that we are inside that matrix, like a, like, um, a pre-born child's umbilical cord, right, connected to mother, we, we are fully integrated into that mother with every heartbeat, every breath. We, this is our nurturing place. And you can almost think about it like the the neural pathways of the delta system that are connected to the sea, right? It, it too knows its deep connection to the tides. It can't not be without that neural pathway or the mycelial web that they talked about last night at the filming of the uh, mushrooms, right? The mycelial web interconnects everything beneath the soil and all we see of it is these mushroom heads popping up hidden in the ground. All of this is an indicator that there is just no separating, no teasing out our experience from the experience of nature. So what has happened that has driven that wedge? And for Karen, she's pretty clear <clears throat> that, the, that the kind of the initial wedge of the departure from the garden, that is pure illusion, is we've domesticated ourselves. Right? We've, we've slowly built up the cushion of domestication. And that from agriculture to the Industrial Revolution to the Information Age, we continue to construct this civilization that holds us, and then we think we belong to civilization. And then we orient to civilization, and that continues to drive this kind of uh, widen, maybe that's a good way of framing it, it widens the gap of our relationship with the natural world. For her, she has traveled down this road that she calls finding feral. And feral is this taking something that's been domesticated and returning it back to the wild, right? That's the process of feral. And in some ways, Karen and her partner and many people like her are like guides to feral again. How do you find your way back into the most dynamic relationship of all? And what are ways in which you can do that, that then begin to build your soul's capacity for this resonance inside of that which already is, right? It's, 
it's all and all that you're held in. Yeah, we call it finding feral mm -hmm. as it's rediscovering what you already know. You already have it. We all have this knowing. Right, but most people don't know that they know. <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're truly saying that, I would not anticipate. I would not know that I already know how to be. But you're saying it's in there. Yeah. And I I I I it's hard for me to understand that somebody couldn't feel it. Um, mm. I think it's, I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately with your questions here yeah. that, that oh, I feel the knowing in my gut. It's not something I feel in my head. Yeah. It's in my gut. And, and this idea of the soul needing this, um, this complete knowing this channel, right? It's made me think of the umbilical cord mm. and I can almost feel like coming out of my belly button is this channel to all of this information, the all of all that is available to all of us always, always has been in, in exactly the same way this information is available to every other sentient being yeah um, and i and i just i feel it it's yeah it's there and when you when you do something like like i got to do when i stood on a mountaintop removal um site in west virginia and stared out at the appalachias that have had the tops blown off of the mountains to get coal out um you just, it's just, you feel it in your gut. Mm -hmm. And when I've had an experience recently where there's a, we, there's a little pond that I can walk to that I visit every day. And there was a, a goose who had a Canadian goose who had set up a nest in probably not the best location, but she had at the edge of this pond and was sitting on what I thought were seven eggs because I'd caught a glimpse at one point and I was checking on her every day and she's gone now. And there's eight eggs just sitting there now, not being cared for. And hmm. you, you feel it. We don't have the words in our language to even speak it because civilization has given us what it wanted to for the the way it wanted us to be able to communicate with each other but it right. doesn't make a space for this knowing mm -hmm. <laughs> i think i think indigenous peoples likely have more of this in their language yeah i would think so too if you could so it sounds like um, there's a knowing that happens like with the um, situation in the Appalachians that has this sort of negative energy to it, right? It, that you're like, it's not a good, you know, you're experiencing that and feeling it at one level. And then there's probably experiences that are super positive too, that it, is, there a, is there a sensation description that you have stumbled into? I guess I, I just, I guess what I would say is I can feel what a frog feels when I, when I watch a frog, I can feel my legs getting wet. If I'm watching a frog in the water, I can feel mm. it. I, I can feel what a creature would experience if I move a pile of rocks and suddenly this creature is scrambling because their house has been like dis disassembled. <laughs> um, I immediately just re relate to that. Like, ah, oh, dang, your house just got moved. I'm so sorry. Like, like, and I just, I feel it like, like this deep empathy. Um, yeah. 
like it's same, same. The Dalai Lama says same, same. I love how he says that too. Like, yeah, that's a great way of framing it. You just look in another creature's eyes and you're like, I'm just seeing myself. Yeah. Oh, that's a great, yeah, that's a super great perspective, I think. For her, she finds it oftentimes in more quiet ways, like just going down to the pond and sitting with the frogs for 30 minutes and listening to the frogs and feeling maybe like frogs feel, or like the Dalai Lama says, feeling same, same, where you're so present for another wild creature that you're feeling frog yourself, right? So staring or being with frog, she begins to see herself more clearly. And that just, a, to me, a powerful way in which to begin to learn how to speak that language that begins to shape the soul of her, right? And she says, you know, frogs, they, they lie in the shallows not because they went to frog school, right? They just, they, they live as frogs in the shallows and to unite with them for a moment in their frogness is, a, if you will, kind of the spiritual experience, right? It is the experience of what it means to be alive. So how do you find yourself in the eyes of frog is just a, Beautiful way. And now she lives in a place where she can visit that pond on a daily basis, right? That can become a ritual behavior. But that's that existential moment of same, same that allows her this departure out from the bifurcation that is imposed on us because of all of our um, creature comforts, right? That we've created that support us. How might we enter more fully into moments when we lose this distinction between our domesticated self and our wild selves? How do we live into same, same? Here are Karen's reflections. Well, it happens very just normally for every other um, sentient being on this planet, and I'm assuming any that are also in the universe other places but it it happens very normally without having to ponder it for any non-domesticated species mm -hmm. it's just happens you watch a squirrel being a squirrel you watch a frog being a frog there is no like hey i'm gonna go to frog school and learn how to be a frog yeah it's it's you you know a tree has the same neural component that even looks like the nerves that we have and um the a river system a delta has all the arching it's all these same um structures that mm -hmm. are just part of this connectedness of this energy field essentially um so it's because we are potentially our species is the first one domesticated. Mm -hmm. um, I've there's a fascinating field of studies can, can you know suggesting that wheat actually domesticated us. So it's oh, all interesting. Yeah, so it's you know very related to changing our food system from mm -hmm. the one where we went and just got the food because the food was there like all the other beings do to right. one where we were controlling the food system and forcing the land to yield to us that yeah. started this this break what it sounds like so domestic domestication of our species becomes a sort of interrupt or this break in the in the tether we have in a sense biologically or naturally it's not like we would have to work at that so much if we did not have to navigate around the complexities of domestication that we've um embraced fully obviously uh and expanded upon uh and is that so i mean it kind of goes to that idea of when you talk about being feral there's some it's it feels to me like that journey is 
is just how do I unwind myself out of at least the oppressive characteristics of domestication. I don't think we can completely unwind ourselves, but there must be some way to, you know, release yourself from some of the oppressive capacity of that. Yeah. Is that, is that how that works for you or? That's exactly what we've been trying to do for the past 10 years. And this experiment and mm. living differently here is to find the creature in us born wild and free and taught by this one right way of living that we're not that. Mm -hmm. And so exactly trying to unpack that, unravel that, like what would be the way out of domestication back into wild. And for us, what has made sense is feral. Feral right. is, a, is a bridge in between those two places and with the full understanding that inside civilization you know you can't be fully wild it's just right. not possible but there is the ability to be much more feral and push back on those structures that have put us into little cages mm -hmm. Dan asks Karen about the practices that can help each of us take the journey. The old adage, less is more, seems like a good start. It just keep choosing less. J don't, don't, don't think about your life solutions as adding something to solve your problems. Go the other direction, you know, the old less is more direction. Less, 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 less is the pathway to finding your way back to, if you will, garden space, right? Just don't add one more thing. Learn how do I let go of certain things? And they clearly um, have taken that approach both with stuff that we use to insulate ourselves, but also kind of like social norms, right? The, the norms of uh, how I look or how I speak or how I, you know, what I'm doing with my time, you know, less is more even in that, right? And we tend to try to keep up with the, whoever the Joneses are, we're keeping up with them for sure. Uh, you know, how do you say, no, 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 I don't need to do that. And it's a pathway. It's just a practice uh, that you can engage that helps you move back towards this more sustainable, I would say, uh, space as well. Karen reflects on how she and her partner manage the delicate dance of living within civilization and embracing their wild selves in order to find a way into feral. Yeah, it's it's definitely a dance. Um, that's a that's a delicate balance um, that can get out of whack at times, but. I, it's we're very purposeful in how we're choosing to live every day and so while yeah sure we still have to engage on a lot of levels pay our property taxes and yeah. <laughs> you know put gas in the car and you know I mean we're we're kids from the city I mean we're civilization addicts essentially in many respects yeah. um but we also have this just this deep again it's like this umbilical cord thing that i just feel like this like this knowing of that we are creatures born wild and free that's where what that's who we are essentially. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the, all the things that we've done to be able to reconnect with that creature, just having the lights down low at night. And, um, you know, I stopped all these practices that culture tells me I'm supposed to do as a woman, like dye my hair and shave my legs and, mm -hmm. you know, alter my creatureness to try to fit some other 
idea of what our species is supposed to look like, you know, that sort of thing. Like, so it's really, it's really just a part of my daily living. Um, Yeah. It takes practice Mm. um, to, to, I mean, we're such a doing, we're, we're not human beings, we're human doings, you know, but really the being is where we'd all benefit from spending more of our time. Um, and just that is a, a, a first practice. Like one of the ways that manifested here was our, through our energy use, because I was very intent on trying to lower our, all of our costs of how much it costs every day for us to be alive. Mm -hmm. Right. As a way to slow down. Like if it doesn't cost so much, I, we don't have to do so much (laughs) to make the money. Right. So, and then it was a personal challenge of like how little energy can we use and still Mm -hmm. feel like comfortable and have, these convenience things and and i love personal challenges so that was a really great way of yeah like and you know we had this big propane tank here when we bought this place and actually there were two on the property and you know we were going out and doing energy activism and it was like oh my god i come driving up the driveway and pass this huge propane tank and it just felt so bizarre so you know, we got rid of the propane and, and then it was easy to just have one utility and figure out how to whittle off of electricity. Mm. Um, and so it's kind of been like a game. It really has. It's been like, we call it experimenting in living differently. And that's Mm. what we've, we've been doing to try to get to that place where it just feels more balanced and okay. Yeah. But it's slowing down and less less of everything. And that's, wow, that's... so hard in a culture yeah. that's all about more. Yeah, exactly. So where do you find the tools that help you take a next step into this journey? A journey back to the garden. A journey that might begin to heal the rift created in our relationship to the natural world. Dan reflects on some options. So where do you find that uh, slowing down capacity? And for, for Karen, she says, for her, it's like moving inside the rhythms of the planet rather than your self-imposed rhythm, right? So uh, some meditation practice I've been in, they're like, Follow your heartbeat down to your rhythm, you know, so you're dum 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 dum, you know, just journey that way, but get or you're slowing down of your breath, whatever mechanism you use or, or the way the wind is flowing. I don't know what it is for you, but you've got to practice this slowing, slowing, slowing down and that there's some sort of um, inside of the rhythms of nature itself, of which we are, right? So. Your healing is in that rhythm. So it's not even as if you have to seek this healing like outside. It's inside of this this rhythm of life that you're a part of. And for her, inside of that, I almost think it's her construction of soul from my perspective. But you rediscover this sense of balance, of, of deep connection, a, a, a little bit of freedom of being more kind of awake and not overwhelmed and smothered. You're, you feel more like a participant rather than someone who's controlling everything. All of those things start to onboard as you begin to slow down. And it turns out that I think we don't need to go to frog school, right? That's the thing. We keep putting ourselves in frog school so we can learn how to croak like a frog. But in reality, we, we do croak like frogs. We, so 
if you could slow down, you'd probably fall back into that experience again. And that in the end, I don't think soul is something, well, I think it is something that we construct in our heads because we all do it, but it also is something that is at a deeper level. And, it's, and it, it, it embraces or is embraced by all that we're talking about today. She says, try to spend time with wild creatures a little bit every day. Maybe just pick one wild creature and be in relationship to that wild creature. So it's, it's that, that find something wild, whether it's the scrub jays or the squirrels in your yard or the birds, or John has a lizard that meets him outside of his sliding glass door whenever he goes outside, and be, be with the wild for a bit and allow allow that same, same experience to inform your sense of soul. Let me close by um, saying what would, what would she recommend um, as sort of a starting place? And she ended with this thought, even though I was ready to get off the interview, she said, just, just the last thing I would say of a way to find, reconnect with this knowing is, um, you know, go and look a wild creature in the eyes and start with the one in the mirror. Go and look at a wild creature in the eyes. Go out and see if you can look at a wild creature in the eyes, but start with the one that's in the mirror. And when she told me that, I thought, Oh, if that's not a parable for our time, the wild creature that's in the mirror staring at you is inviting you into this sense of soul that's grounded in the very womb space, right? That's been holding us for billions and billions of years. See where that journey might lead you and me along the way. Thanks for spending some time with us. We hope that Karen's reflections might help you find your feral self and maybe a more robust experience of Gaia as soul body. In our next episode, Dan explores the notion of soul that emerges as one reunites to the very earth body in which we live and move. Is there another way to experience this relationship beyond the construct of language that keeps us in our heads all the time? Can we move toward a felt sense of our deepest relationship to the planet? Join us. This episode of Soul Forum has been brought to you by Storycatcher for iPhone, a fun and simple tool that helps you create shareable keepsake video stories. Be the documentarian in your circles. Find Storycatcher, spelt as all one word, on the Apple App Store. You may attend Soul Forum Live each Sunday morning at Creekside Commons in Lafayette, California. The 30-minute presentation is also live-streamed via YouTube and Facebook, where people interact via the chat. After the live stream is complete, for those gathering in person, we then enter into a non-recorded group discussion on the day's topic. We'd love for you to join us for Soul Forum. <laughs>